Hey everyone, this is Fina. Uh, you may know me from my YouTube channel, Reveal in Light, or my uh, blog, Scars of Avalon, or even my Substack newsletter. However, this is uh, a bit different than all of those in that this is uh, more off the cuff. I tend to think of audio recordings like this as being more off the cuff, and you'll notice that I don't, well you won't notice, but I'm conveying it to you, that I don't have a script for this. So, in general, this is probably only going to interest and entertain people who actually enjoy hearing people speak in a more long-form manner. I, I hesitate to call this a podcast because I don't really think it is. Also, I really tend to think of podcasts as being something more collaborative, so I know there is a ton of people who do solo podcasts. Uh, I think this is kind of just a mixture of stuff that interests me that I would feel more engaged and obligated to make in an audio format. So, the first topic that I wanted to cover was uh, how we consume and how that changes our lifestyle, mental health, and our ability to think clearly. So when I say consume, I mostly mean foodstuffs, drinks, etc. Though, you know, if you're predisposed to more of an anti-consumerist bent, you can surely consider this to be something like um, uh, what you buy, what you look at, what you listen to, what you are immersed in, what kind of environment. Uh, it's really just kind of taking in any external stimuli and uh, how it makes the brain go woo, you know, to that extent. So, uh, one of my main uh, interests in this topic comes from the correlation and perhaps causation of the many mechanisms behind the gut-brain axis. So, for those uninitiated, the gut-brain axis is what it sounds like. Though, don't be mistaken in thinking it's just the stomach. The stomach is, after all, only an organ. It's the, in the entire GI tract. And the GI tract compromises everything from the mouth all the way down to the anus. So, it's very, 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 very big very long. What I'm specifically talking about is more of the microbiota, the microbiome, that exists all throughout the GI tract. And this is going to be everything from your beneficial uh, bacteria to um, the hormones that interact with them and also to uh, the signals that they send your brain and how your brain kind of processes that and then sends it back out. I want to preface this also by saying that this has nothing to do with Andrew Wakefield and his really spurious claims that autism, which is a developmental disorder, is somehow caused by vaccines or they cause some kind of gastrointestinal distress to happen that triggers the autism. Actually, if anything, but again, a developmental disorder is present at birth. That's why you develop it as you develop mentally. Of course, it's going to show more as you grow older and start to develop more mental faculties. Yeah, it, it makes sense. But no, this is not anything approving Andrew Wakefield and his bad science. He's He has himself rescinded the claim and he's a fraud. He's not where it's at, guys. But, this is not to say that the gut microbiome is just totally discounted because he was a quack. On the contrary, the gut microbiome uh, is a pretty integral part of uh, the human experience, both physically and emotionally or mentally. So, we can see if we consume certain foods how those foods will affect us. Uh, for example, people who have 
a more high fat diet, which we are predisposed to enjoying genetically. We do like uh, foods that are higher in fat. We also have a predisposition towards salt, the savory taste, the umami, which is uh, the taste buds that are in the back of the mouth, and sweet, which is why candy is so popular and why a lot of people have high cholesterol or high blood pressure. They simply just like the taste of these things. We must realize that with these things, we are getting certain um, macronutrients from them. So for example, a diet that is higher in carbohydrates will provide more energy, though carbs do tend to calm us. They do provide more energy for us. They provide the most energy for us. Uh, because those are what we mostly use for cellular respiration and that's what kind of gets us to do the action whereas if you consume a lot of proteins you'll notice that you don't have as much um, like raw energy though you will see muscular development you'll see probably faster recovery times if you do injure something and generally it's good for people who want to grow so for children it's especially helpful to have a lot of protein because they do need to grow their bones and everything but carbs are really what's gonna and the glucose that is derived from carbohydrates so when food is broken down carbohydrates specifically there's this thing called amylase in your saliva that kind of breaks it down it's called catabolism and it breaks down those bigger starches, more complex starches, into simple sugars. Glucose, galactose, lactose, maltose, etc., etc. Those need to go to your brain. So, if you're one of those people who is like, I need to quit sugar, I urge you not to quit sugar entirely. It is not going to benefit you in the long run, and it is almost impossible, especially if you live in the United States. The United States for decades has, because one of the biggest crops that is grown in the U.S. is corn. So corn syrup and soy are added to our diet en masse, and it's really hard to find something that doesn't have some sort of thing. Some sort of corn syrup, some sort of soy or thing, and by the way, this is not me saying, oh no, if you eat a lot of soy, you will turn into a soy boy, and the phytochemicals will alter your brain chemistry. That's not true, it won't. Going back to the, you know, the sugar argument, the reason you feel bad is because when you quit sugar, you have a sugar crash, is because your brain doesn't have glucose anymore. You're depriving it of something it actually needs. This isn't to say overdo the sugar, but you need some kind of sugar in your diet. That's why you can't focus. You feel like you, you got that, you know, the haze in your brain. You can't, um, you can't concentrate. Memory is hazy. Uh, sometimes you have like a shorter attention span. You get cranky. It's because you don't have enough glucose. Your brain is literally saying, bro, I can't function, you haven't given me enough food. It's like if you don't feed the baby its formula, it starts crying. It's because it doesn't have food. <laughs> You're depriving it of what it needs to kind of keep going. Our brains consume a pretty high amount of glucose, more than, I think, any part of our body. So, as we consume and the stuff goes through the GI tract and the gut and everything, it sends the neurotransmitters and it is and gives it the glucose and that gets us to kind of keep going. Same thing, you know, people, and this kind of goes back to the gut biome in terms of the bacteria, but people who don't have, you know, who have a gluten intolerance, like celiac disease, for them that's affecting the microbiome. That could cause, you know, diarrhea, constipation, IBS, etc., etc. So their microbiome is screwed up because they can't have that. You know, they have a food allergy. It's not working. It's same thing if you have ever had acne. And I mean, not like one or two or, you know, from time to time, if you menstruate, it, it shows up uh, around the time where you're going to start your next menstrual period. I mean, like you have a overabundance of it. You could have a food allergy, specifically a, a dairy intolerance. 
and I am not saying by any means that everybody who has, you know, uh, chronic acne has a dairy intolerance, trust me, acne is so complicated, it is, <laughs> it's insane, but a lot of people will find if they stop consuming certain foods, especially dairy, a lot of the times it calms down, it's because your gut is freaking out, and it's causing you to break out. Antibiotics are another big thing for the gut microbiome. Uh, if you, and I'm not, again, I'm not, see, I have to caveat every single argument that I make and every claim because it's going to get associated with the people who are like, my child had the MMR vaccine and, and now they can't eat X, Y, and Z, or now they can't poop correctly. And it's like, no, it's not why, it's, it's not what vaccines do, but, um, certain times our overuse of uh, antibiotics, prescriptions, and ingestion of them for stuff like uh, ear infections, sometimes for just a common cold, maybe even strep, but strep depends. Sometimes strep is viral and they don't know, so they give you the antibiotic and it doesn't work. Upper respiratory tract infections, if we consume an overabundance of them, especially when younger, our microbiome kind of gets all funky funky and you end up killing off the good bacteria that was just trying to mind its business. And that can lead to decreased immunity because some um, bacteria are actually good at protecting us from outside pathogens. And sometimes if you upset them, they... If they don't get killed off, they get all, you know, ornery because you've changed their environment. They start to act up. Uh, so, like enterococci, you have E. coli in your GI tract, you can have salmonella in there, and they can start to act up. And that's not good because you don't want them either acting up in your GI tract or traveling somewhere else in your body because you've now made that environment inhospitable. You don't want them, especially in your, um, like your urinary tract or anywhere near there because you can get a bladder infection, urinary tract infection, whatever. Some of you who are interested in this topic may have heard of a fecal transplant in which a person's feces is then, uh, that has good microbiota, you know, you're all good, you're, you're having your fiber, you eating your yogurt, maybe you're putting some Benefiber in your water in the morning. <laughs> uh, the person with the good microbiota is, their feces is given to the person with the uh, impaired one, and usually, I mean, the process is kind of gross if you think about it, you usually have to kind of put it up their butt, so the uh, bacteria can kind of crawl in there <laughs> and access the GI tract. I guess it's better than eating it, I guess you could do that if you wanted to, but that's probably the easier way, but anyway, they go in there, and the person, you know, a lot of people report very, very, very good results uh, from this uh, decreased bloating, um, their appetite comes back, uh, the decreased nausea, less bowel cramping. Now, you got to be careful with this because you need a person whose microbiota is not compromised because you, t you take it from someone that was good and then you give them a bad one, things get not so good. Uh, I mentioned hormones earlier. So most of our hormones, or the sex hormones in particular, are going to be derived from sterols. So cholesterol is a sterol. Um, vitamin D actually helps with sterol productions. That's why it's good to go outside, you know, besides it helping your skin, but hormones in general are very important in their interaction with the brain, and a lot of them are produced by the, by the gut, by the GI tract. Um, the ones that break down your food, but also, say for example, um, the pancreas is an endocrine organ, but it's also a digestive organ. You have signals being transferred between the two. So, say, you know, your brain 
is um, after you eat something, your brain is sending you some some dopamine. And dopamine is, it's the pleasure chemical. It's not always good to have too much of it, but it is. And your pancreas and whatever is breaking down some stuff, you know, helping to break down any... And it's going, yeah, that seems pretty good. But when you combine dopamine with process that's happening in your gut, so for example, the breakdown of fats or whatnot, you get subconsciously trained to associate, you know, that the food that you ate is good. It's processed well, it happens, you don't eat, nothing bad happens from it. The dopamine and the hormones that are interacting to process your meal are now saying, oh, good job, that was fun. This is not something that hurt me, and I liked it from the brain perspective. Like, yeah, let's keep going. But... You know, this kind of gets a little whatever when a person is either their pancreas is kind of overdoing it or underdoing it. For I meant to say underdoing it because in people who are diabetic, type 2 diabetic, they're still internalizing that good feeling of, you know, the, let's say the high fat food, but their pancreas and their liver are kind of like, I don't know if I can do this, buddy. I don't know if I could do this. With alcohol, it's also very similar, especially with the liver. You know, it's like, buddy, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I'm trying to kick out a lot of toxins here, but also process the fats that you're eating. It's a little too much for me, but your brain's like, keep it coming. <laughs> your, your nucleus accumbens is like, yes. <laughs> so, um... You, you have the stuff that's kind of slowing down in the processing, but your brain, which is still continuously being supplied that glucose that it needs, so you're not feeling all whacked out, and you're not feeling like, oh, that thing is, you know, I'm not feeling good. Maybe this isn't so good after all. You're still like, yes, I'm getting the glucose. The reward chemicals are still coming. They're still coming, even though your body's like, oh. <laughs> so it kind of messes you up there. Uh, I guess I should very briefly kind of go over what I just said about the nucleus accumbens. So the nucleus accumbens is a part of... Uh, this is going to get kind of complicated, but in your brain there are certain areas that are associated with you, your external stimuli control your insides or how you feel about that, the, the external stimuli. So, this is found in the subcortical area, primarily, if we're going to go with the more feeling-associated things and the neurotransmitters. In this area, you have a few things, like you, for example, you have the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, which smell triggers the hippocampus. So, if you smell cookies or something and you're like, oh, this, is, this reminds me of cookies that my grandmother used to make off the hippocampus. But we have other areas uh, such as the basal ganglia, which a lot of dopamine kind of cycles through there. And also in that area is the nucleus accumbens as well as the VTA, the ventral tegmental area. And this area is known as the reward circuit, or it's part of the reward circuit. It also interacts with you know, stuff such as the amygdala, which, no, is not just, oh no, it's the scary organ for psychopaths. It's really not. <laughs> In people who aren't psychopaths, it just regulates how we emotionally process fear and um, the faces of people, like how their faces make us feel. Um, usually it has to do with more negative emotions, but... If you're kind of, if your nucleus accumbens is being targeted more so by, you know, the dopamine and serotonin dumping of the food you're consuming and that stuff's good, it's going to be like, yeah, good, yeet, yeet, yeet. But because you can feel your brain, your brain has an immediate effect. So anything happening in your gut kind of immediately shoots up to the brain. It also helps that uh, several cranial nerves I believe the vagus one, the vagus nerve I know is definitely connected to the stomach somehow. Uh, you know, senses stuff like nausea and stuff in the brain can trigger the visceral organs to nausea. 
or to vomit. But getting back to the VTA and the nucleus accumbens, if since you since the brain automatically with those neurotransmitters and it's not just dopamine it's not just serotonin you have norepinephrine you have uh, GABA acetylcholine glutamate etc but with dopamine especially if if that's feeling good and it keeps being produced there and produced there or serotonin which is your feeling of sati uh, satisfaction also kind of controls the hunger drive this is Hypothalamus will do that too. If these things are being activated and your visceral organs are having a struggle, you know, they're on the struggle bus, you're going to be more inclined to perceive what your brain and the chemicals are telling you than, for example, what your liver's telling you, because you don't know what your liver's telling you. <laughs> you don't know if your liver's like, buddy, I'm struggling here until, you know, you got scar tissue on it. And then it finally starts to show up in your physical symptoms. You get jaundiced or whatever. But that's why it's so important to have a good link between your awareness of what your GI tract is doing and how it's affecting your brain. For example, people with acid reflux, GERD, have probably a better connection with it, but again, they have that connection because something has already gone wrong. They're refluxing all of their stomach acid into their mouth and it gets them nauseous and it gives them heartburn, so there's a visceral feeling. But this is already when it's too late. You don't know beforehand if you, if you have GERD until it starts manifesting for you. Same thing with the gut microbiota. If you don't pay attention to it, or if you don't kind of try to hear what's going on with it, you're not going to know what the hell is happening with it. It's just going to be a complete mystery to you until you're like, man, why can't I go to the bathroom? Why am I, why am I having cramps? Why do I feel bloated? Why am I nauseous? Why, why this, why that, why the other thing? So I think the important lesson for this episode is that what you consume is really directly affecting how your brain and the rest of your body go about its its day. And I'm going to very briefly touch on kind of the non-food stuffs. Let's say you see something that makes you feel or is making you feel scared or is making you feel like you're empty even. This is the type of digital diet or, or material diet, uh, news, social media. This can be, uh, like this compulsion to always know, like always know what's going on can even be a compulsion to always have a certain level of security or a certain this, that, or the other thing. If you collect even these things that you, you're bringing in, if they're not, if you're not modulating and kind of balancing the good with the bad, because it's all about balance, you're going to find that you you start to feel what those things are. Like, you actually take the feeling from those and they come into you and they stay there. Kind of like you have a virus inside of you. That's why it's not good to consume too many things that, not say you shouldn't challenge yourself, but there's a difference between challenging yourself and just kind of self-harming without getting a razor you know so y this is like disturbed sleep patterns again too much norepinephrine you're you're very wakeful you can't it's not enough GABA you don't fall asleep very much the chemicals and I hate to be one of those people that's like it's the chemicals in the brain nothing else nothing else matters because it definitely does but what you take in is what you then become and then that sometimes that can be what you get out yeah again if you have like a digital or material diet let's say of stuff that's keeping you awake simulating your norepinephrine and inhibiting your GABA now what you also have to understand is that if you try to kind of uh, adjust this accordingly you'll find that if you kind of change your material circumstances or your digital diet, 
you will find that in the body you inhabit, it will change accordingly. So, for example, if your lifestyle seems to kind of be leading you towards making decisions that make you more jittery, reduce the amount of things that stimulate the dopamine, the acetylcholine, the glutamate, etc. Because you're too hyper-focused, you're too uh, hyper-vigilant, you really need to kind of relax. So you need to do things that promote the, like, as I said, the GABA and everything else, to, to come to the surface. This could be medication, absolutely. If you need to be on medication, be on medication. There's no problem with that. If you need to change your diet, then do that. And especially if you need to change things that you know are creating bad memories, creating bad memories in that hippocampus, then stop. Because if you create bad neural pathways, that just kind of fire off automatically when something happens. It's like driving down a road and there's no exit ramp. You can't get off of it. You have to build an exit ramp, essentially. So, if you find yourself in a pickle, change the way the things that you're inter that that are external to you, how they change your internal environment. Because I guarantee you, if you can do that, you will be able to think more clearly. Remember, everything relates back to the body. We are stuck in this physical vessel no matter what. We have not yet been able to transfer our consciousness into other objects. We just, it's not something we can do yet. We may, honestly, we may never be able to do that. So, listen to the body, listen to the gut, brain, and everything in between. Keep an eye on yourself. Oh, before I go, I should mention stress is a big one for these. Stress and inflammation. If if you find yourself having problems commonly associated with information, you need to do something about that immediately. It's not only stress that can cause it, but stress is a very, very big one. Because our bodies didn't, you know, drop down from the clear blue sky being like, yes, I am ready to work 80 hours a week and grind and hustle and XYZ and be completely fine, <laughs> you know? Just be aware. If you go to the doctor and they say you have some inflammation issues, you gotta tackle that right away because inflammation will destroy you. Yeah, inflammation, stress, and lack of sleep is another thing. They will destroy you. So if those things are affecting you, look to everything that goes into you. Everything from in, that from out to in. And say, can this in some way cause inflammation? Can Is this causing the stress? If so, you got to either uh, modify it in some way or like flip it on its head, see if you can find a positive in it, and then go that way or just get rid of it because it's going to destroy you. All right, that will be all for this episode. Uh, I hope you enjoyed um, my... Uh, I don't really want to call it a podcast, <laughs> but maybe that's what it is. I hope you'll uh, join me again next time, hopefully, and we'll see where this goes. Alright, take care.